With the recent development of high throughput sequencing, there is a much faster from bench to the bedside translation. Um, because in the early days, researchers do their molecular biology experiment in the lab and doctors have their separate meeting in uh, with other doctors. There was not a lot of crosstalk, but um, because of high throughput sequencing, patient tumors can be directly sequenced. Scientists can look at these mutations and those help understand which patients respond to what drugs. And then that can very quickly inform the doctors on um, what, how the patient can be treated. And because of high throughput sequencing that became available in the you know, 2007, um, in the last decade, we see many major US hospitals starting to do tumor profiling programs. Um, in fact, for hospitals like Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, their patients are every cancer patient after diagnosis will get a mutation profile. And so um, this is not really sequencing their whole genome. At least at Dana-Farber, we sequence only a few hundred genes. These are usually driver genes that are frequently or recurrently mutated and um, anything that have a known drug or have a clinical trial um, that's potentially targeting that mutation is in the mutation profile. And some other uh, mutations, even without the drug, as long as it's a recurrent mutation, they are in the tumor profiling panel. And so um, the Farber one probably have a, like a few hundred mutations. Um, recently, uh, Dana Farber also started the, on a selected basis to RNA profiling of the tumors. And the, the goal is that based on the specific mutations the patient carries in their tumor, um, the patient can be then matched to a particular drug, which will only kill the cancer cells carrying that mutation, but spare the normal cells. And so um, the patient are getting this mutation profile for free. And uh, in, for example, the case of uh, non-small cell lung cancer, almost 40% of the patient can be matched with a targeted therapy. Therefore, um, that mutation report is very important. You know, if the patient has a, a mutation with a targeted therapy, then they may not need to be treated with chemotherapy, which is really toxic. And, you know, patients very often have very bad tolerance to the drug. And uh, so even though they are lucky to develop cancer, if they are matched to a targeted drug, they are kind of luckier at least. And sometimes patients can be matched to a clinical trial even for a new drug that's under development because they have a, a mutation with a, a new drug targeting it. Um, unfortunately, still most of the mutations have no known drugs. Um, so out of the you know hundreds of mutations that we profile, only yeah minority of those mutations have a known drug that can target them. And also tumors uh, very often develop resistance to targeted therapy. These are especially true for metastatic tumors. Very often you can have a drug, you use it for a while, and then uh, the, the patient will develop resistance. So um, let's show this, uh, I'll, show, I'll show you this example. Uh, so this is in uh, melanoma. There are often uh, 40 to 60% of the melanoma have um, a mutation in the BRAF gene. This is a, another kind of uh, a mutation that causes a whole kinase cascade of uh, signals. You can see here um, after, you know, like BRAF is here, uh, upstream there's RAS and downstream there's ERK uh, or MAC ERK. And so these are kinases. And then they activate a transcriptional program to start cell proliferation. And so 40 to 60% of the melanoma carries a mutation called V600E. So on the 600 amino acid, um, the, the V valine is uh, mutated into a E. I don't remember what this, yeah, the, another amino acid. And so there is a small molecule inhibitor called Vamurafenib, which can really you know, block the, again, the enzymatic pocket at, you know, this mutation. Uh, because of the, this mutation, the, the, 
the BRAF can be constitutively active without an upstream growth signal, and the small molecule can just inhibit that. And um, this is an example of a phase two clinical trial. Um, you can see here 50% of the patient or 53% of the patient with the BRAF mutation can respond. They really benefit. Unfortunately, the duration of the response is fairly short, only six months. And the overall survival of those patients is 15 or 16 months, which means that um, even though a lot of patients, you know, this is an example uh, of a paper that's published at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. This is unfortunately only a 38-year-old uh, male with the BRAF mutation and um, melanoma. You can see uh, this is their melanoma. This person has so many tumors on their body. When they are treated with the BRAF inhibitor um, in 15 weeks, it's really like a miracle. All the tumors disappeared. Um, this per person is like normal now. Um, unfortunately, 23 weeks after the therapy, the tumor has grown back and eventually this patient passed away. Um, it, and so a lot of the, the targeted therapies, the patient can stay on for a while. And even if they continue to use the drug, they benefit, their life get extended, but it's only for a short time. Um, uh, so by the way, before we move away, I want to show you something. Um, it's notable that in this figure A and C, if you look at where the tumor appear in C figure, even though in here you do not see any tumors left, when they do grow back, they grow back at almost the same spot. You can see there was a tumor here and now it's here. There was a big tumor in here and they are here. Right? There are three, one, two, three in here and there are these one, two, three tumors here. And so it seems that the kinase inhibitor hasn't completely killed the cancer. When the tumor grow back, it's growing back at the same place. So it probably means at this point, the drug was able to kill probably 95% or even 99% of the cancer cells in this location. But the remaining one to few or 5% of the cancer cells that are resistant to the drug gradually grow back. And because they are no longer being controlled, whether they're resistant to the drug in the first place, they grow back at the same location. And so this is a table showing you the progression-free survival of many different targeted therapy. Progression-free survival means um, from when you see the drug having an effect to the, the drug still maintaining the tumor growth inhibition. How long can this drug uh, be used before the tumor starts to grow back again? That's the progression-free survival. Um, and so you can see, you know, that for, for androgen receptor uh, in prostate cancer, there, there is like a one new drug which works for five months. In breast cancer, this works for 5.8 months. And you're like, oh, didn't people use tamoxifen for, uh, you know, for forever and it's really effective. Um, for the non-metastatic tumors, tamoxifen is very useful. And sometimes surgery was already taking the effect and tamoxifen is only used as an adjuvant setting to make sure there's not any residual uh, tumors near the primary sites, those are more effective. But for the already metastatic tumor, you can see a lot of these new drugs that takes years and years to develop. And these drugs are also very, very expensive. They are only able to extend the, uh, the uh, this is also the average time uh, of the progression-free survival for the drug, even for HER2, uh, for trastuzumab, you can see here, the uh, effect is only 30 months. Although there are sometimes really lucky patients, their tumor are completely cured, uh, but the average is not very, very exciting. And so, um, in fact, uh, we mentioned here, metastatic tumor developing drug resistance accounts for about 90% of the cancer death. Patients don't die from primary cancers. They, they die from metastatic tumors. And once the, pay, the, the tumors become resistant to the, to the drug, then you know if there's no additional drugs that can kill it, then the patient will, will die. And if we look at the different um, BRAF 
inhibitor re resistant tumor. So over the years, um, when the patient develop resistance to a drug, um, in many research institutions such as Dana Farber, we would collect the patient tumors. You know, in this particular case, you can still collect the patient tumors. Um, and then do either mutation profile or RNA expression profile to see what are the changes that cause this tumor to become resistant to the, the drug. And it turns out there are many, many different mechanisms. Sometimes you could see from the same patient multiple you know, metastatic tumors. If you just test their multiple lesions, you would see this multiple pathways um, like come up to evade the uh, or resist the drug. And so far, there are a number of uh, resistance mechanisms. Um, so for example, um, this is, uh, say, a, a, um, a, a signaling from outside. And if this is mutated, um, it will have um, a, a um, so no, normal cell is like this, but the, um, the if there is a mutation, this this kind of cell surface proteins, like usually the um, EGFR or HER2, you know, these type of uh, cells, I mean molecules that are on the cell surface, which normally takes a growth hormone signal in order to activate. But with a mutation, they can be constitutively activated, and then the downstream signaling will be will be on and the cell will start proliferating. If you have a small molecule inhibitor, it can block the activity domain of this, um, say, EGFR. Um, you can block its function. But there are a number of resistance mechanisms. The first is that um, supposedly this drug can uh, block an enzymatic pocket the cancer cell can develop a, a need, another mutation on that enzymatic pocket, making the drug no longer fitting the pocket very well. So the drug cannot get into that pocket any, anymore. This way, the, the um, EGFR can now get, or can get activated. Uh, again, then it can st stimulate the downstream growth. Uh, another possibility is um, when this, this first signal is on, it stimulates RAS, there could be a parallel pathway. So there is the uh, EGFR, HER2, HER3, um, e EGFR is the HER1 in some sense. Yeah, there are different other uh, gross uh, hormone receptor pathway, and they can all activate the same RAS pathway downstream. And so if this is no longer a path. The cancer cell, basically the cancer cell genome is very unstable. It's trying all sorts of things to stay alive and keep growing. And so if one way is blocked, the cell will try another way, use another uh, growth, uh, overexpress or mutate another one on the, on the parallel pathway to activate the downstream uh, RAS uh, ERK pathway. Um, the third way to evade this drug is because this drug only blocked the upstream signaling, there could be additional mutations on RAS or on RAF. And these mutations, once they happen, they don't need anything above. They can start constitutively activating everything be below and so that they bypass the, the upstream activation. And uh, the final one is there's a, a completely different way for the cell to grow. It, it does not take this pathway at all. It's just a totally different pathway, which can also help the cell grow. Um, and so all these together can make the drug become, become the, the cancer cell becoming resistant to the tumor. This is because um, one of the hallmark of cancer is um, genome instability also epigenetic instability from both the DNA level mutations can happen and on the RNA or epigenetic level, the cell can change their transcriptional programs to depend on another pathway or another gene for the uncontrollable growth. And so um, the, the, the general mechanism of resistance, um, there is innate resistance, which means, you know, you probably didn't profile the right patient and they, they never really uh, should be treated with this drug anyways. Um, so they, they don't respond in the first place. Um, but also there is um, uh, acquired resistance. So, so for example, initially the tumor um, 
were like this. And as it grows, additional mutations were acquired. Some of them were passenger mutation, but uh, other ones can be driver mutation that help the initial mutation so that the cell can grow even faster. And then when you have a drug, um, it will probably kill most of the cells that say supposedly initially there is a driver mutation. Maybe there is a drug that kills 99% of the cancer cells, but then there is a little clone which have an additional mutation which becomes resistant to the drug. And, and then this thing will gradually grow back. And that's why um, the relapsed tumors very often appear in the same location as the primary, the, 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 the initial, not the primary tumor, the initial metastatic tumor. Um, if it's in here after the drug treatment, the tumor might disappear, but actually there could be 1% cell in here and then gradually it will grow back. You will see the same tumor on the same location. Yeah, so um, from you know, somatic mutation, copy number variation, gene expression change, epigenetic changes, because the cancer cell is unstable, it's trying all different ways to evade the, the drug. And so in order to really identify a resistance mechanism, um, we mentioned one way is to look at um, the patient evolution. Um, you could look at one patient from before and after treatment, and sometimes you can follow. Initially, they responded, and then after they relapsed, you can take the relapsed tumor, compare with the original tumor before treatment, and see what changes happened. Are there additional mutations? Are there additional, or are there difference in expression or epigenetics? Uh, we can also look at patient cohorts. In this case, um, if we have a group of patients that are treated with the drug, you know, for example, in that melanoma um, phase two clinical trials, only 53% of the patient responded. And so it would be interesting to look, um, you know, compare the tumor. Uh, usually these are pre-treatment tumors. Um, we, we take their uh, tumors and do a DNA or RNA sequencing. And then after the patients were treated with the drug, you look at the difference between the patients who responded versus non-responders, and you ask, what is the difference? We can also look at the um, pre-treatment samples versus the post-treatment samples. And this depends on you know, whether the responder tumor are, are still present. Like sometimes you can see the tumor shrink but it's still there, that's when you can use the surgery to take out the re residual tumors and do profiling. But sometimes um, if the tumor is responding very well, you may not re even feel a tumor in there anymore, then you can't really take the tumors. You can only take the non-responders, but not the responders anymore. Um, so um, we want to show one study that was published in 2017. These are uh, MDS uh, patients. Mm -hmm. So th this is kind of like a pre-leukemia phenotype. And the patient had been treated with something called um, az uh, azacytidine. This is like the uh, one of the uh, chemical weapons that people use in World War I. It's like mustard gas. Uh, turns out this thing is pretty toxic, but um, it's, it, it can kill cure the MD or at least treat the MDS patients. And so um, the, uh, the authors in this study collected the MDS from the bone marrow and they are asking, you know, what's the difference between the responders and non-responders before treatment and what happens after treatment. And so if we look at the uh, responders compared to the non-responders, you can do differential expression analysis and look at their pathways. Um, and uh, they can also look at the patient survival. You can see here when the patient is a, is a responder, they have longer survival, but if they don't um, respond to the drug, they die earlier. The, the, the survival part is pretty standard. Um, but the gene expression analysis, you know, you definitely see significant differences. Um, and uh, uh, this is the pathway analysis. Um, they look at what are the enriched pathways that are upregulated in genes in the responders or upregulated genes in the non-responders. And um, you can see here, uh, they, they are quite different pathways. 
Um, and they also did gene set enrichment based on the level of differential expression between the responders and non-responders. But you can see here, um, we mentioned this last module, you will see a lot of things that you have already learned earlier in the semester. Once you are given the patient expression profile, I think every student in this class should be able to do these type of differential expression and pathway analysis and understand the mechanism better. Um, so there are some challenges in analyzing clinical cohorts. Um, the, the first challenge is it's ultra high dimension. Because we are doing DNA sequencing, you are essentially evaluating thousands of genes for mutations. Uh, if you do RNA sequencing, you're also, again, evaluating tens of thousands of genes for their uh, expression. Whereas in these clinical cohorts, I think for this particular study, there were about 20 patients there. And so the patient count is so much smaller than the gene counts. So multiple hypothesis testing is an issue. A lot of these clinical studies, when people look at uh, how patient tumor evolved from initially responding to the drug to becoming resistant to the drug, uh, relapse from the drug, is called a case study. There is no statistical power, and you are just reporting this as an observation. Um, yeah, so this, you know, to really identify a general mechanism could be hard. And the second is um, sometimes it's very difficult to collect and profile these clinical samples. Um, usually it's easier to collect the samples before a treatment. For example, we say, well, do you want to get your tumor profiled? We can, you know, doctors can help the patient select the best targeted drug that can be used on the patient. Usually the patient are, are kind of, uh, uh, happy to be profiled um, because they can potentially avoid being treated with a very toxic and non-effective drug. But after treatment, it could be difficult to collect samples, especially if the patient is responding, um, especially uh, if uh, the, t the tumor is in the internal organ. If it's melanoma, it's on the body, you know, like you can just scrape it off, it's easy. But if it's in the liver or kidney, um, then the patient do not want to have a very invasive procedure to collect the, the tumor biopsy. It's possible if the patient develop a resistance after the drug treatment, they might be receptive to taking another biopsy to see whether a new drug should be used. That's okay, uh, but it's, it's still very difficult to take. You know, you, you usually cannot it's not like a surgery. You can take a big chunk of tumors to do many different profiles. It's usually just a little core biopsy, tiny amount. Um, and so usually not enough to do many different type of profiles. And uh, um, um, these are also fairly expensive, although sequencing now is getting cheaper and cheap, cheaper. Um, and the third is it is impossible to do genetic manipulation on the clinical samples. You can't knock out the gene or you know, test the treatment of the drugs. Um, therefore, we need other experimental procedures or models to do this. Okay, so um, any questions about the second part? <laughs> 